Amen. Thank you, Carolyn, for that beautiful piece of music. Well, good morning, St. Andrew's family. It is great to gather, uh, even remotely, like I feel like I say that every week, um, but by the power of the Holy Spirit gathering together to worship our risen Savior. Uh, it is just great um, to know that my friends and my family are, are, are out there, that uh, even though I don't see you here in these pews, I know you, and to be able to worship together is a great joy. In the midst of all of this, there is still lots going on in the life of our church. And so I just want to point out a few of those things. One of those is um, we're starting a brand new sermon series this week. Uh, really, really excited about uh, it'll, be, uh, it'll be fabulous. Um, Jimmy will uh, say, share some more uh, as he starts his sermon today. Uh, we had uh, Faith on Cork last Friday. We've got Faith on Tap this Friday. Um, we are still doing our Wednesdays drive through uh, and Connects. Uh, it's going to be on this campus, uh, the Southwest Campus, um, at, from 8.30 uh, to 10.30. We invite you to come. It is just a great opportunity to come see Pastor Jim and myself. Uh, some other staff um, are around. We get an opportunity to check in, pray, um, really in... Uh, and just see each other. It's nice to uh, know that our, our, our friends are actually out there, flesh and blood. Um, so we invite you to that this Wednesday, 8.30 to 10.30 on the Southwest Campus. Our children's ministry is still doing their Sunday school live at 10.15. Um, our youth groups are doing their socially distanced uh, uh, youth groups and small groups on Tuesday and Wednesday nights. Um, if you have questions about either of those programs, uh, feel free to contact Heather and, he Heather and Shelley um, or Tim and Rochelle, um, and they'd love to tell you a little bit about that. Um, one of the things I'd love to be able to do that we're really excited about um, is, is pray for our preschool. Uh, as some of you know, as we've been watching the news, uh, there's been a huge conversation about uh, starting school, not starting school, or doing uh, uh, online, in person. What do we do? Um, and I want to take a moment and pray for um, teachers. Uh, you know, my kids started on online school this last week, and all of their hard work that they've been doing. But our preschool is starting this um, tomorrow uh, with a limited number of students and classes open. Uh, and uh, our, our preschool director, Corey Planer, and her team have been doing an amazing work. Their teachers, as they're prepping, have been doing this tireless um, work just to make sure that um, it's safe. Uh, and I should say that our, our custodial staff and admin team, just incredible work to make sure that this, as our classes start uh, this week, um, that it's safe, uh, educational, and, and uh, it will be a great time for the students. So I just want to um, lift them up in prayer real quick. Gracious and loving God, we thank you so much for our preschool and what a blessing it is to this church. God, we thank you for... Corey and her team and the teachers, and for all of the board, um, our custodial staff, all of them who have worked tirelessly to make this possible. And so, God, we just ask that you bless them. Bless them this week. Um, we're just so thankful for educators who continue to work tirelessly um, and really in a, in a thankful, thankless way that really want to educate and help um, our children thrive. So God, whether that is an online teacher, or it's um, our friends at Push that are starting this week, um, or our very own preschool, I just thank you and praise you for all the work and dedication that has gone into coming this far. And God, we just pray a blessing on this year. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. One last thing is we continue to um, move towards reentry. Um, one thing that I've said it a number of times that St. Andrews is a gracious place. St. Andrews uh, congregation is there, folks filled with grace. Um, and so uh, we thank you for your patience. And just know that our session is meeting every two weeks. And every two weeks, we're reevaluating. We're looking at all the statistics from um, uh, 
around the state, around our county, um, what our schools are doing, what our partner churches are doing, and reevaluating what it looks like for us to reenter. And so would you continue to pray for our session, pray for the leadership of this church as we seek, truly seek, God's will for us as a congregation? The reality is, is that uh, some of us have had great weeks, some of us have hard, hard weeks, but the reality is, is that we're together. We're together as a community, as a body. Um, we're together with the Holy Spirit. We're together with God. And so let us now take a deep breath, realizing that no matter where we find ourselves, we are not alone. Amen. Will you please join me for the call to worship? Let us come before the Lord with open hearts. Let us bring our broken dreams and our conflicts and our griefs. For God is good, and out of sorrow will come new gladness. The Lord will fill us again with power to sing with joyful hearts. Amen.
Will you join me this morning in our corporate prayer of confession? O God of heaven and earth, creator of all we have and are, we come before you today as those who need your help with faithfulness. We long to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, yet our service to you has fallen short. O oh, give us the strength of your Holy Spirit that we might set our hearts more squarely on the goal of unwavering commitment to your Lordship in all of life. Amen. Let us now enter into a time of silent confession. Friends, the good news of the gospel is that our story does not end in sin, but because of the love and hope of God, that even while we were still sinners, God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever trusts and believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's through that good news of the grace and love of God that we can be assured now and forever that we have been forgiven. Friends, as God and Christ has heard our confessions and forgiven us of our sins, let us now each offer that same peace and forgiveness to one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace, peace, peace. The scripture this morning comes from the letter of James, chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if anyone are hearers of the word and not doers, they're like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who will forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mm. 
Amen, amen, amen. I think we can all relate to being weary travelers. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Carolyn. Some of you might have read the article that I wrote in the Cross Currents that described growing up in Florida, I got to see my good share of hurricanes and tropical storms. And I remember as a child, and I even remember the name as Hurricane David. And I remember seeing palm trees break, almost as there were twigs, uh, some of them landing on cars. I remember seeing one of those metal trash cans just flying through the air as if it was just dust. And I even remember currents and waves and tidal push that destroyed roads and created floods. Now, it has been decades since I've lived in Florida. My parents still do. And... Um, I have still become kind of a hurricane nerd. I, I actually have an app that usually rings about three in the morning that tells me when a tropical storm is starting to form outside of Africa. Um, yeah, I'm weird like that. But one of the things that has always touched me following the news stories, and you see this with tornadoes and even fires, is seeing the aftermath. And what's interesting, as soon as you see the picture of destruction, there's always someone in the background already starting to rebuild. There's people cleaning debris, picking up trash. And what I love about after a storm is there's always a united front to rebuild. 
you will see people across zip codes, socioeconomics, across barriers, uniting together to rebuild their community or neighborhood. Here's the challenge I think we're facing as individuals and churches after the storm of COVID is I'm not sure we're going to actually visibly see or measure the aftermath is caused. Uh, many people are writing how worldviews are changing, values, economics, the way we see technology, use technology, the way we see people we care about and community and physical distancing. I think way beyond this, we're going to be cautious to hug each other. And we're not going to know all the outcomes. And some are even saying businesses, organizations, and even churches will not know the positive or negative effects of all of this, maybe for years to come. Now, there are church experts that say for churches to not only survive, but thrive this crisis, and even after the crisis, during all the aftermath, is important for a church to know who they are. They need to have a clear mission that they live out. And they have to continually, the leadership and staff, ask the question, what is essential? What is the key ingredients to our ministry? I believe this is how a church can recalibrate and how we at St. Andrews can build a new future together. If we're clear about who we are, we can always navigate the unknown. We have to ask as a church, what do we hold as essential to our purpose and to our existence? And this only isn't important for the church. It's important for us as people. As we're facing the winds of the day, we have to ask, what is our vision? What are we building our lives on? Now, I believe the Holy Spirit divinely orchestrated the fact that about two years ago, the session decided to do a review of our mission statement and our statement of faith as well as our vision. And uh, I love how God does things. We put a team together in 2018, and it was called an action learning team to review our mission statement, vision statement, and at the time, the tenets of faith. The action team was led by Clark Lance. The original members was Louise Boos, Brian Cochran, Erica Cornett, Scott Fiore, and Bill Rickert. If I left anyone off, I apologize. But from January and June of 2019, they had 12 focus groups. They surveyed many, many people, got lots of input, put all that input together, went back to the session. The session said to another committee they created with elders and also staff folks to then take all those recommendations from the original committee, put it together, fine-tune it into a document, wordsmith it, and then we went back and forth for six months from the session and that team. And then two months ago, two years later, we finally decided and voted on our new mission vision, and statement of faith. Now, one thing I love about the process is we as a church community at St. Andrews, we have different opinions, and we're not afraid to share them. But we also have a foundation that has survived many crises in the past, in the present, and many crises way beyond COVID. God will protect us as long as we know who we are. Now, what I'd like you to do today is you'll have to multitask a little bit. Some of you guys are watching this on a screen or TV or computer. If you could pull out your phone or tablet and actually go on our website while I'm preaching, look up, there's a little box at the bottom that says vision statement, and you can follow along as I'm preaching. So I'm going to refer to it, but you'll actually have it in front of you. And so our vision is this. To know God and make God known through lives transformed by Christ. That should sound familiar because that vision statement has not changed. Now here's our mission statement. I think our mission statement represents what I call three legs to a stool. Looking upward, the idea of worship, this idea of prayer. 
maturing inward, which is spiritual formation, spiritual growth, and discipleship, and then reaching outward, where we're salt and light to this earth and to this world. And again, this should sound familiar. We just wordsmithed it a little bit differently, changed the order around. But it is these three statements that actually brought me to this church. I didn't help create them. They actually were created way before I got here, and I was drawn to them. Now, our August sermon series is going to be called Building Together. And the reason why is I really do believe as things calm down, on the outside we may think we might be starting to get outside of the crisis, but there will be causes, outcomes for a long time coming. And as a church, I want us to build together as a united front on who we are. And so I'm going to share our statement of faith today. And then next week, this is going to be really fun. We're going to talk about our mission of looking upward. And we're going to have uh, our very own uh, worship director, Ben, and worship director, Mark, give the sermon next week. Mark said he would absolutely do it if I sang the solo next week. So next week should be very interesting. And if you're wondering if I'm lying... I'm lying. Um, the following week, we are going to talk about the mission of maturing inward. And we're going to have uh, Shelly Aiken, our director of children's ministry, Tim Christian, our director of um, student ministries. And they are going to actually uh, preach the sermon and share 10 minutes each. And then on Labor Day, we're going to ha- share the mission of reaching outward, where we have Ruth Ann. And who is our outreach director, and Connie, who is our adult discipleship director. Why this is so important is you've heard Matt and I several times. Our staff is doing a lot of heavy lifting behind the scenes, and a lot of our directors, I don't want you just to see what they do. I want you to hear their hearts, and they're wonderfully grounded with the true foundation. My hope and prayer is that we will be reminded, not just as a church, but also as a people. What are we building our lives on? What is our purpose? What is essential? My hope is that as we're talking about this as a church, maybe it's time for you out of this crisis to come up with your own personal statement of faith or your own mission statement of how you want to live your life. So today we're going to look at our statement of faith, but I want to first look at a parable. I love this parable. I remember it from my childhood, and any parable that has water in it, I like. And so here is Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Now, it's often a parable labeled, Hears and Doers, and I love this so much, I titled my sermon this, but also it is the theme this morning. As a church and as a people, we're called to be hearers and doers. Here's Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on a rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house. And it fell and great was its fall. One of my favorite writers and scholars is, no question, but it is Tom Wright. And I I love his work. And he tells this wonderful story. He loves to hike. And he lives in England and Scotland. And he says, when you hike mountains or hills in England, Scotland, and you start off in the morning, you're going to start with fog. And one of the dangers throughout history of hiking there is that often when the trails that have been there for centuries take different turns, because of the fog, you may not see it. And so he says, for centuries, people put little stone triangles called cairns, and some of you know these, we have them even in our own desert, that point the way so you know which way to go. 
Jesus in Matthew 5 through 7, right before this parable, makes a very clear path for us as followers of Christ. He gives these wonderful collection of teachings called the Sermon of the Mounts. It's kind of the essential teachings of Jesus, the essentials of the faith. It would be like Jesus' own mission statement. Now here's what's so important, and I really encourage you to read chapters 5 through 7. Throughout church history, churches and denominations and movements will take some of the teachings and leave out others. We have to take the totality of Jesus' teachings and some push and pull. And when we hold them in tension and we look at them holistically, it's often we can get truth as we try to live out the teachings of Jesus. We have to look at all of it. Now, the Sermon on the Mount was on a sermon that Jesus taught from a mountaintop. Make sense? Um, he started out with blessings, and we often refer to these as the Beatitudes. Now, what he teaches in 5 through 7, you have to realize, is almost countercultural. It's almost turning the values of the Greco Roman culture on its head. And he is saying things like, we have to mourn over sin. That blessed are the poor in spirit. Followers of Christ are meant to be salt and light to the world. Followers of Jesus are meant to be gentle, peacemakers. This is very different than the world they live in under Roman occupation. They were called to be merciful, pure in heart. And here I love this. Willing to suffer persecution, mockery. Endure insults for what they believe. I encourage all of us to read Matthews 5 through 7. Now, the parable that we just read actually ends this teaching, and I love this because he's saying, Everything I just taught, just don't hear it, but do it. And I've shared this a dozen times. I've met Christians who know the Bible better than most scholars but they're still jerks. <laughs> you see, knowing the scripture is important, but living it out is mandatory. As our lives have been turned upside down, let's be honest, the winds are blowing. We must rely on the foundation of who we are. We must not only know Jesus in our hearts, but we must live Jesus wherever God has us. And this is important for us in our individual lives, but it's important for our future as St. Andrews. We must know what we believe and live it out. As a church and as individuals, we must live Jesus. So our church, when I first got here about 11 years ago, had three tenets of faith. Now, one was on Jesus, one was on Scripture, and one was on marriage. Now, for years, I've gotten emails like this. Why do we not have anything in the tenets about the Holy Spirit? Why do we not have anything in the tenets about the Trinity? You know, what about the greatest commandment of loving neighbor? It fits our church. Why isn't it in our tenets? Why is our theology of marriage on the top three? And so over the years, these emails and these questions, and we get them a lot, believe it or not, in our new members classes, we realize we need a fuller statement of faith. And that's what we did. We have created, and as you look at it, to a much fuller, longer statement of faith. We did indeed take the tenet about marriage out. Um, let's be honest, that is a controversial subject within the church, but also, it was the one item that got the most feedback in all of the focus groups. And there was many who says we need to keep it in. And there was many in the majority who says, I believe in marriage, but I'm not sure it's our top theological foundation. So I want to be clear here. We're not saying marriage isn't important. We're saying there are so many teachings of Jesus that we need to wrestle with to follow Christ, our Savior, that all of those teachings, we can't pick some over the others. Rather, a statement of faith 
And a lot of the statements of faith we see from other organizations and churches are primarily foundational statements of theology about what we believe. And so we think we have a thorough statement of faith. And we believe that we've put a lot of work and prayer in this. And so here's what I'd like to do. I I didn't want to share because I didn't want to read it out loud. Uh, I felt like you could do that on your own time. But then I realized there's something powerful about speaking it out publicly. And so I'm going to share a statement of faith abbreviated, but I want this to be like a spiritual exercise. You can read it fuller on your own or as I preach. But here's what's going to happen. After I read each belief statement, I'm going to ask the question, am I building the foundation of my life on this or something else? I want us to really wrestle with this because I think belief statements often can be files or documents or beliefs that are esoteric. But are we really building our life on that foundation? And when I did this, I got convicted. So here we go. God, we believe there's one God creator, only one God, creator, sovereign ruler, and sustainer of all things infinite and eternal, present and personal. We know the one true God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, who are one in essence. Here's the question. Am I building the foundation on my life on who God is? Here's Jesus. We believe Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Am I building the foundation of my life on Jesus or something else? I would say the danger is sometimes Jesus is one of our priorities rather than all of our priorities shaped around Jesus as being the foundation of our lives. They're slightly different. Here's the Holy Spirit. We believe the Holy Spirit is God's constant presence in the world. Am I building the foundation of my life on the Holy Spirit? Are the decisions I make led by the Holy Spirit or just my desires and my mind? Those are important, but we need to be led by the Holy Spirit in all that we do. Here's the Bible. We believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. The Bible is the unique and authoritative witness to Christ and the world and our ultimate guide in Christian life. Am I building my foundation of my life on Scripture or something else? How many of us, when we're making life decisions, go back to Scripture? Prayer. We believe prayer is our essential and intimate conversation with God. Am I building a life of prayer? The great commandment. Jesus told us that the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Because Jesus loves us. He then commands us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Am I building the foundation of my life? with love. Here's the great commission. We believe we are commanded to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Do we see our primary purpose and foundation is being a light of Christ to the world? Or is that secondary? or third, or fourth, or not even on our radar. Missions. We believe God calls us to love and serve others. Am I building an outward focus as a foundation of my life? And here's the church as the last. We believe the church encourages and empowers believers to use their spiritual gifts to collectively carry out Christ's commandments to preach the good news, to love our neighbors, and serve all people of the world. Am I building the foundation of my life of being part of the community of believers? 
Do I just see my faith as merely between me and God and Jesus? Or am I allowing the church to be a movement that I'm a part of? I believe as we stand on our beliefs, individually and corporately, it defines who we are. And it can't be just words that we think. We can't just be hearers. We're also called to be doers. Last fall, I told you about a town called Kamishli in northern Syria. It was a beautiful town. Uh, the school was in session at the time. People were at work. And suddenly, overnight, this beautiful town was destroyed uh, by the Turkish offensive. And they started bombing the city. People started running this out of the city and fleeing the city, not knowing quite what to do because they weren't expecting it. And I read this article about a guy named Pastor George, and his church was right in the middle of the city. And as people were fleeing, he stayed in the city, and he distributed medical supplies and helped people get out and, and found food. I remember a couple months later, I was just so touched, and as I was praying for Pastor George, I wanted to know what happened. And he did end up in a refugee camp. But here's what's interesting. As he was in a refugee camp, they used modern technology with a program called WhatsApp. And they were able to pray for each other and care for each other and stay connected. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was thinking as I've been praying for him over the months, I said, I wonder what ever happened. And so I Googled again. And Pastor George and his congregation and the members of the city were allowed to leave the refugee camps and to start going back to the city to rebuild. And this was January of last year in February. And as soon as they started to rebuild, COVID hit and they had to become isolated. Again, the winds of this church were blowing against it, but it did not blow down. Through de modern devices and through this WhatsApp, they were able to create a distribution of food and medical supplies. And though they couldn't physically rebuild and they couldn't even worship together, they were rebuilding even before they could physically rebuild. And they stayed together and became stronger. This doesn't surprise me because throughout church history, there is wonderful, wonderful stories of churches and world wars, churches in communist countries, churches within dictators, churches within plagues that not only survived, they grew and thrived. I believe when a church has a strong foundation of who they are, and when we are people who have a strong foundation of who we are, Nothing can come against us. But we have to stand on that firm foundation. We have to not only be hearers, we have to live it out with our lives. And so that's my hope and prayers. We get to hear some of our wonderful staff share what our mission is as a church. We share it, but all of you, you live it. And I'm excited that the winds are blowing and we're finding out what we're made of and everything can be ripped away and when it is we realize all we have is Jesus and Jesus will hold us Lord I thank you for this wonderful community of believers that has survived crisis in the past and will survive crisis in the future I'm so thankful for how community of believers throughout church history have survived all kinds of tragedy and not only survived, but thrived. We need you. We want to follow you. We want to be hearers and doers. In your precious name, Jesus, amen.
Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this day and every day that you grant us, that as we woke this morning, it's your breath that's filled our lungs, that as our eyes opened, graces and mercies were renewed. God, help us this day and every day build our lives on you as our foundation. Help us build our lives on your truth. Help us build our lives on, as we, as we learn more about you and our lives are changed, that we are able to love others. God, as we prayed earlier, we thank you so much for the educators, the teachers, the staff who are working uh, amazingly hard to prepare themselves. And then, so again, God, we pray for our preschool. We pray for each and every student that um, is able to come, God, that they are enriched, that they are loved, that they are shown your love, and that they are safe. God, as we look around this world and we see threats of war, we see famine, we see, um, we see folks still without clean drinking water, God, we see the destruction that happened through Nebraska and Iowa and, and Illinois. God, help us be people who want to build your kingdom. Help us be people who want to serve the least of these. Help us be people that want to be the first one with a broom after a hurricane. Because, God, we know that it is what you've asked of us. is not just be hearers, but doers of your word. So, God, we pray today that not only do we build our lives on the foundation of you, but we are freed to be doers of your word as well. It's through your word. It's through your love and grace and mercy that we are given that opportunity and the ability. So we give our lives to you today, God, and every day. And we thank you and praise you. And God, hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we prepare to receive this morning's offerings, we say it every week. So it's not just a broken record, but God really wants our time, treasures, and talents, but he really wants to start with him as a foundation. Him as a foundation in our hearts. So as the music plays over us, let us give back with grateful hearts, not just with our time, treasures, and talents, but with our lives in thankfulness for all that God has done for us.
Lord, we're trying to be hearers and doers. Allow us with all our gifts, our time, talents, and treasures to live out your kingdom. Allow us to touch the world through the ministries of St. Andrews. Allow us to change and transform our own community and even here our church. We dedicate all these gifts in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for worshiping us with this morning. Know the people of St. Andrews, we love you. I want to thank all the singers. It's great to worship together even when we're not physically together. But I'm going to send you out with simple words. Keep doing what you're already doing. Build your life on what matters, what will last, what will last not only on this kingdom, but in the kingdom of come. Just know that your Savior loves you and is holding on to you and will never let you go. Amen. Just yeah.